Pagkatapos ng bilangan Sana naman ang panalo ay Kaumbayan Sino kayang mananalo At Are you ready to start? Go ahead, Ma'am Tati. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Patricia Liquanan. Welcome to Voter Conversations, organized by Edu and Sux 2022. We are an informal network of private and public colleges and universities Recording that in progress. to work on voter registration and education on campuses. During the voter registration period, we focus our efforts particularly on first-time voters among students to enable them to register and to vote in the coming national elections. We are now concentrating on voter education and have embarked on a series of election-related fora, which we call Voter Conversations. Today's Voter Conversation is EDSA on my mind, remembering the 1986 People Power Revolution. On February 22, 1986, exactly 36 years ago today, millions of Filipinos trooped to EDSA and courageously stood up against the military might of the government and peacefully overthrew the dictatorial regime of President Ferdinand Marcos. Those four days in February were the culmination of the anger and discontent that had been expressed in the parliament of the streets during the Marcos totalitarian rule. And EDSA changed the course of history, not just for the Philippines, but also for other countries that were inspired by us and modeled their own nonviolent democratic movements after ours. We were free at last, and the Philippines was the toast of an admiring world. But memories are fleeting. Yes, even fickle. Most of those who marched and prayed, offered flowers and shared food, those who faced guns and tanks at EDSA have grown old. A whole new generation of Filipinos were born after EDSA and systematic historical revisionism in textbooks and in social media have deprived them of any proper knowledge, much less appreciation of the significance of those four days in February, 1986. Should a nation be allowed to forget such an important part of its history? Should the years of struggle and the ultimate restoration of democracy in our country simply be wiped out from our national consciousness? Today, we have EDSA on our minds. We remember the 1986 People Power Revolution and why it happened. And to help us remember and learn from EDSA, we have invited personalities who were part of the EDSA generation. We selected our speakers to represent sectors that played major roles in EDSA and the years leading up to it. We have a representative of the church, a citizen who rushed to EDSA in the early hours of February 22nd and stayed till it was all over, a student activist at the time, and a representative from the military. We have asked them to share their memories from 36 years ago and their thoughts on EDSA today. 
Before I call on the speakers, we have prepared a brief video to set the scene. Please watch. Our first speaker <clears throat> is Bishop Pablo Virgilio David, or Bishop Ambo to most. A recognized scholar of sacred scripture, Bishop Ambo is Bishop of the Diocese of Caloocan. He is one of the leading voices against President Rodrigo Duterte's bloody anti-drug campaign, which he witnesses firsthand as he tends to his flock. Bishop Ambo is also known for his powerful sermons at his masses, streamed regularly on Facebook. There was much excitement, not only in church circles, but also among the broader citizenry when he was elected president of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, a term he just began in February, in January, in December, sorry. In February 1986, Bishop Ambo was a young, recently ordained priest. Welcome, Bishop Ambo. Magandang hapon sa inyo lahat. Three years, um, three years na ako sa pagkapare noong nangyari ang EDSA People Power Revolution. Alam nyo, akala namin noon, wala nang pag-asang ma-restore pa ang democracy through a peaceful means. 27 years old na ako noong 1986. Well, batang-bata at idealistic. We were aware that, um, you know, we were aware of what was going on. Kahit nga sa seminaryo, pinagtatalunan namin ang tungkol sa proper political move 
para matapos na talaga ang one-man rule na sobrang grabe ang perwisyong ginawa sa ekonomi ng bansa. Biro nyo, elementary pa lang ako, si Marcos na ang presidente. Nung high school ko, siya pa rin. Nakadalawang legitimate terms naman siya. No? Four-year terms uh, as an elected uh, president. Yung first uh, four-year term niya, 65 to 69. And then 69 to 73 dapat. Pero yun nga, nag-declare siya ng martial law noong September 1972. At hindi na siya umalis sa pwesto. Ipinaaresto ang mga oposisyon, pinasara ang mga telebisyon at mga radio stations, pinagbawal ang press freedom, sinara ang kongreso, inabolish pati yung constitution na naging batayan niya ng pagdideclare ng martial law. Buong college ko, martial law. Gumraduate ako, martial law pa rin. Buong five years ko ng graduate studies in theology, Martial law pa rin. Na-ordain ako sa pagkapare five months bago pinatay si Ninoy Aquino noong 1983. You know, after that shocking assassination of Ninoy Aquino on August 21 of 1983, parang biglang nagising ang mga Pilipino. People became more bold and daring in expressing protest and dissent. Ang matunog na slogan noon ay Tama na, sobra na, palitan na. Before August 1983, ang kulay ng protesta ay red. At syempre, red was always tagged by the dictatorship as communist. Hindi naman ngayon lang nauuso ang red tagging noon pa man. Communism nga ang ginawang dahilan o justification ni Marcos sa pagdideclare niya ng martial law. And any form of activism was easily associated with communism. Mula August 1983, biglang naging yellow ang kulay ng protesta. Walang kinalaman nito sa Liberal Party, by the way. Hindi na siguro alam ng mga kabataan ngayon kung bakit yellow. Galing yun sa kantang Tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. May kwento ang kantang yun tungkol sa homecoming ng isang lalaki after several years of imprisonment. Actually, sa araw na yun ng homecoming ni Ninoy Aquino, ni hindi niya nakita ang mga yellow ribbons na tinali para i-welcome siya. Doon pa lang kasi sa tarmac ng airport, binaril na siya. At grabe ang reaksyon ng taong bayan ang dilaw naging kulay ng pagluluksa. Kilo-kilometro ang haba ng pila sa burol at gayon din sa prosesyon sa libing nakita niyo kanina sa video. Kaya ang dilaw noon ay isang sigaw. It became a political statement na ayaw na talaga ng bayan ng dictatorship na dapat nang ibalik ang demokrasya. Right within the church sector, there were many who had begun to give up hope on non-violent protest because of the dictatorial government uh, and because the government was using a lot of violence against its own citizens who publicly expressed legitimate dissent. It was, you know, really the dictatorship that had pushed many young people to go underground. And as far as the leftists were concerned back then, there was no other way anymore to end the dictatorship and to restore the democracy except through an armed revolution. Well, one might compare the Philippine political situation back then to what is presently happening in Myanmar. The difference, of course, is that Myanmar's dictatorial government is ruled by a military junta. Marcos's government back then was still a civilian dictatorship but military backed. Siguro kung nagtagumpay yung rebel faction sa military noon na tumiwalag na sa government sa kanilang binabalak na kudeta because they were going to declare a kudeta, kung nagsucceed sila sa pagpapabagsak sa dictatorship noon at sila yung nagtake over sa gobyerno, baka military junta din ang namuno sa atin. At ewan ko lang kung bababa pa sila sa poder at magsasubmit sa civilian authority. Actually, sinikap din ng uh, sinikap din nga ng militar uh, nitong mga rebel military groups 
na pabagsakin ng civilian government at ilang beses silang nag-attempt ng kudeta, di ba? Panahon ni Cory. Salamat na lang at hindi sila nag-succeed at eventually nasanay na rin ulit silang mag-submit sa civilian authority. Sa totoo lang, meron ding mga bishops noon sa CBCP na nanawagan ng full cooperation with the dictatorship. Obviously, ang motive nila ay maprotektahan ang mga institutional interest ng simbahan. Pero noong early 80s, mas lumalakas na yung salitang critical na pambalanse sa salitang collaboration. Kahit si Cardinal Sin, critical collaboration ang bukang bibig niya nouuna. Pero unti-unti, lumakas na rin ang advocacy for non-collaboration, ang panawagan ng civil disobedience. You know, during the, those three years, 83 to 86, nag-build up na muli ang clamor for the restoration of democracy. Parang isolated na isolated na talaga ang dictatorship sa international community. Kaya na-pressure ng husto si Marcos na magpakita ng konting democratic space. Napasubo tuloy siya nung i-challenge siya ng isang foreign journalist kung willing ba siya na maglunsad ng isang snap election para patunayan kung talaga bang gusto, na niyang, gusto pa siyang manatili ng taong bayan. And his mistake was he took the challenge. Grabe ang tindi ng dating ng snap election na yon na nangyari no February 7, 1986. Isang babae ang katapat ng diktador. It was so unthinkable at byuda pa. Pero sineryoso ng taong bayan ang eleksyon. Para bang nagkaroon muli ng pag-aasa. And imagine, kami nga, first time sana naming makaka-experience ng totoong eleksyon noon. Ang campaign materials, mura lang, yellow ribbons lang. Pero very effective. Marami rin ang hindi naniwala na papayagan ng gobyerno ang isang clean and honest election. Na nawagan sila na yung iba na nawagan na iboykot na lang yung election na yan. Meaningless yan ang sabi nila. Naglabas ng pastoral letter ang CBCP dated January 25, a few days before the February 7 snap election. Ang dating ng letter parang warning sa gobyerno to paraphrase their message para bang ganito nilalaman don't you dare cheat in this election please respect the will of the people at ano bang naging resulta ganun na nga dinaya nga pati mga teachers na in charge sa bilangan sa COMELEC nag walk out sila mula sa PICC nang hindi na nila masikmura ang ginagawa nila kasi iba yung lumalabas na resulta doon sa binibilang nila Diniklara ni Marcos na panalo pa rin daw siya. Naglabas ng statement ang mga international observers, mainly that the election results were, that were released by the government were fraudulent. Kaya naglabas ulit ng second pastoral letter ang CBCP dated February 13, 1986. Mas malakas ang dating ng sulat na yon. Kinunde na talaga ang nangyaring pandaraya sa eleksyon at dineklara nila na wala ng moral basis ang gobyerno ng diktador. Kinilala nila bilang isang moral option ng taong bayan ang manawagan ng civil disobedience. Sabi ng sulat, A government that assumes or retains power through fraudulent means has no legal, no moral basis. Pero giniit naman ng bishops na hindi pa rin sila agree sa anumang pagkilos na magiging violent at madugo. Ang sabi nila sa sulat, the way indicated to us now is the way of non-violent struggle for justice. This means active resistance of evil by peaceful means in the manner of Christ. Sino bang mag-aakala na sa loob lang ng nine days after lumabas ang pastoral letter na yon, ay mangyayari ang isang mistulang milagro na nag-start noong February 22, itong araw na ito mismo. Ang maliit na bansang Pilipinas ay biglang parang lumaki sa mata ng buong mundo. Tinutukan ng mga foreign journalists from all over the world ang mga pangyayari. At kung may matatawag tayong isang golden moment sa history natin, isa yun sa mga hinding-hindi natin dapat kalilimutan. Actually, yung kinatatakutan ng CBCP sa sulat nila ay muntik na talagang mangyari. Muntik nang pumutok ang isang civil war. 
Nakaabang na ang mga government military troops para lusubin ang mga nagrebelding sundalo na tumiwalag na sa gobyerno. Baka siguro kung natuloy ang sagupaan ng dalawang kampo, baka umagos ang dugo noon. Pero grabe, ang lakas ng loob ng mga milyong-milyong mga Pilipinong nagpunta sa Camp Krame at Camp Agonaldo sa kahabaan ng EDSA at pumagit na pa sila. Humarap sa mga tangke at mga armas ng magkabilang puwersa. Namigay sila ng pagkain at tubig sa magkabilang kampo ng mga sundalo, nagdasal, kumanta, nagprosesyon kasama ang mga images ni Mama Mary at Nagrosario. Hindi sila umalis, naglamay ng tatlong araw, Feb 22 to Feb 25. May dalang mga transistor radio para makinig sa Radio Veritas na naging radio bandido. Sila ang naglalabas ng mga padawagan ni Cardinal Sin para pumunta ng EDSA at magbantay at magdasal. Kaya nung lumabas ang balita na lumipad na mula sa Malacanang Diktador, talagang nag-iyakan ang mga tao. Nagtagumpay ang paglalamay nila. Natupad ang pinapangarap na peaceful restoration of democracy sa pamamagitan ng people power. I hope you never forget that glorious moment in our history that saved our nation from violence. I hope we never forget the sacrifices of many unsung heroes and martyrs who worked hard for the peaceful restoration of our freedom and democracy. Because if we do so, we will lose the respect of many countries that followed our example of a non-violent means of achieving social change through what became known then as people power. Marami salamat po. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Bishop Ambo. That was really riveting and brought us back 36 years ago. Our next speaker is Solita Colias Monsod, Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of the Philippines. Winnie is the legendary teacher of Econ 11 to generations of UP students. She's also a media personality as a regular columnist of the Philippine Daily Inquirer and Business World, and is popularly known as Maring Winnie, the host of Bawal Ang Pasaway Kay Maring Winnie, a political talk show on GMA News TV. She has served as Director General of the National Economic and Development Authority and is the convener of the Philippine Human Development Network and frequently serves on the advisory board of the United Nations Development Program, Human Development Report. In February, 1986, Winnie and husband Chris Monsod were among the very first to arrive at Camp Krame in response to the call of Cardinal Sin. Welcome, Winnie. Maraming salamat, Tati. Alam niyo mga, ka, mga anak, when I woke up on that fateful day, Saturday, February 22, 1986, alam ko, Sabado yun, hindi ko akalain that participating in a revolt was going to be on my radar screen. I was looking forward to a weekend recuperating from the physical, mental, emotional roller coaster now, we Filipinos had been on since the election day on February 7, two weeks before. And, you know, preparing myself for, you know, the ongoing battle. Because, alam niyo, sabi nga ni, ni Bishop Ambo, no, on February 7, the snap elections were held. Alam niyo, the, na the nation had only given two months to prepare, kaya nga snap elections. Within those two months, the NAMFREL, the movement, national movement for free elections managed to bring together 500,000 volunteers. Ganyan katindi. All over the Philippines to watch the election, count the, and secure the ballots, count the votes and secure the ballots. I was one of those volunteers. And nine of them gave up their lives for the cause so actually, you know, the Namfrel are the unsung 
heroes of the EDSA kasi you know they were they set the stage i bring this up because it was the namfrel parallel count yung namfrel quick count that which were based on electoral return uh, official election returns that which contained the signatures it had to contain the signatures of the BEI and the namfrel volunteer that was in charge of the, that precinct kung walang uh, wala yung dalawang signature hindi mabibilang yan kasi ang nangyari, yung walang signature na Namfrel, dyan nagkaroon ng katakot-takot ng dayaan. Alright? So, it was the Namfrel par parallel count which alerted the country and the world to the Marcos's attempt to steal the elections. Plus, of course, there were reports from the field of violence and goons in the polling places and the courage of the Namfrel volunteers to protect the ballot boxes. Ayan talagang high sa roller coaster. Remember at the time, you know, <laughs> there were 15 major daily newspapers, five major TV stations, 300 radio stations. Marcos or his cronies controlled most of them. Ang independent lang, yung Radio Veritas, the Catholic Church, the one newspaper, Business Day, which was supposed to be a business newspaper, and one TV station. Think, isipin nyo lang, ang information control during that campaign. And yet, Cory won another high. The parallel count of Namfrel showed Cory ahead by a comfortable margin. And then the Comelec count naman, sa PICC, showed the exact opposite. Under normal circumstances, that would have been the end of Cory. So that was a low in a roller coaster ride. Fortunately for the Philippines, the world was watching. International election observers from the United States and 17 other countries were in the Philippines to observe. And so were a host of international media observers. Kasi nga, 20 years na si Marcos dyan eh. Marcos had no recourse but to allow them in since he had bragged in the American media na sinabi nga ni Bishop Ambo that the Philippines <laughs> was a working democracy. And the story, yung story ng mga, mga foreigners that was that the guns, goons, and gold were used but failed to suppress the will of the people. Ayan. Tapos, an even greater blow to the Marcos machine was that 30 computer workers work out of, working in the common account being held in the PICC on February 9, they walked out. Sabi nila, there's both tampering and manipulation. Naku, mataas na naman kami sa roller coaster. Then on February 11, Evelio Javier, the governor of Antique and a staunch oppositionist, was killed in a public toilet, inside a public toilet near the provincial capital by bodyguards of the local administration leader, Arturo Pacificador. That was a low point kasi talagang in open, you know, everybody saw it. Talagang walang hiya yung mga, mga tao. And... But that was the low point in our roller coaster ride. And then there was diplomatic, com but the diplomatic community was in full attendance at Evelio's funeral, which, which was a big boost to the anti dictatorship movement. Tapos, on February 15, Congress, yung Batasang Pambansa, declared Marcos and his running mate, Arturo Tolentino, the president and vice president elect. In spite of everything, the walkout, the number of parallel count, that was the lowest of the low. But you know, Cory Aquino wasn't having any, any of Sabi niya, I was told, she called for, a, for, the, for her countrymen to a tagumpay ng bayan rally at the Luneta. I was told that her advisors, mostly male, huh, wanted a smaller venue kasi baka kukunting tao ang pupunta you know, maka, nakakahiya. Sabi niya, hindi pwede. She wanted to know if the Filipinos were behind her. Understand, folk, that was, that was all, mostly by word of mouth. Wala tayong mga, <laughs> mga cell phones, wala tayong ganon. You know, when, when, when we were saying, you go to Luneta, ayon, word of mouth lang yon. 
No cell phones, no computers, no iPads. Alalahanin natin yan. And so I went to Luneta by the LRT. That was the first time I, 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 I rode the LRT or MRT. Basta. But, and my heart was in my mouth kasi I did not know what to expect. But I was going. Basta. Ganun yan. Ganun yan. Well, <laughs> apparently, two million other people had exactly the same idea as me. To give you an idea what the size of two million would mean today, at you know, end of 1985, ang population Filipinas, 54 million people. Two million were in EDSA. So if that happened today, the crowd would reach, would reach more than four million people. That was the Filipinos showing their, their support. They did not know what was in store for them there. But sab sabi kasi ni Cory, punta kayo dyan, tagumpay natin yan, we went. And that is when I realized that we could and, and would win our country back. Big, big high on the roller coaster. Tapos sabi ni Cory sa amen, you know, we were to boycott all Marcos Cory Crowley establishments and there would be nationwide civil disobedience. So there I was, February 22, resting after planning, planning, as we're all Filipinos for the battle ahead. You understand, mga kapuso, kapuso, excuse me, <laughs> mga anak, we were primed. And I thought it would be a long, long, drawn-out war. I wasn't even listening to the radio. Yung, some Namfred volunteers, Lea Navarro and Tony and Javi Claparols, came to the house and we were talking leisurely about what we are going to do about the boycott, about possible plans. But, uh, you know, chica chica lang. Then I got a call from Cheche Lazaro, a woman. She wanted me to find out, to check the Enrile house. He lives in front of us kasi eh, to find out if there was any activity going on. It was she who told me about Ponce and Riles break with Marcos. So, so pinadala ko si Lea across the street. And sabi niya talagang walang tao ron, you know. Shortly after that, I got another call. This time from Betty Go Belmonte. She was asking where Christian was and said, I must reach him, I must reach him. And Joe Concepcion, ayan ang dalawang, Christian was uh, Secretary General of Namfrel, Joe Concepcion was the chairman. And they must go over to Cardinal Sin at the Archbishop's Palace and tell them to go to, and tell the people to go to EDSA, you know, in front of Camp Scrame and Aguinaldo. Kasi nakausap niya yata si Defense, si Eddie Ramos, and we belong to the same church noon, and he was joining in realist group. Apparently, ang plano nila is the people would be protecting the military, yung military na nag, nag, uh, nag rebel. So galvanized, I sent Leah and Tony and Javi to where Christian and Joe were, and they, they, they brought the two to Cardinal Sin. Monsignor Sok was with him, was the only one with the Cardinal at the time. The Cardinal asked Christian, to draft his message, he would be on Radio Veritas at 8 p.m. Tapos pumunta ako sa mga anak ko sa nasa simbahan sila and I was going to EDSA and camp, uh, that I was going to EDSA and Camp Aguinaldo. They refused ba naman to be left behind kasi lahat sila, volunteer ng Lamfrel. We went in different cars and the car I was in was the last to be allowed inside the Camp Crame, I mean Camp Aguinaldo before they closed it. So my children were left outside. <laughs> and wala akong magawa. We went to Ponce and Riles office. Ako, the lights of the building were so dark. I mean, they, you know, the lights were out actually because they were afraid of being bombed. That was how insecure they were. And uh, I saw the fellows were later defined to me, si mga gringo onasan. They were not, they looked very insecure. <laughs> Nako, sa opisina ni, ni Ponce and Rile, Menagi Iyakan, etc. And Mr. Ponce and Rile was really, I thought he was gray in the face. And that's how I joined the Edsa Revolt. So you must understand, mga anak, it did not take place in a vacuum. The people, we were primed for it. We were ready for boycott and 
and uh, uh, civil disobedience, etc., by the events of the recent and the distant past. So when I went home around midnight, Elsa was overflowing midnight, huh? and that was one radio station. But eh, everybody was tuned to it. The cardinal had come through, as did Butch Aquino's contingent. And you know, I was in Elsa for the next three days. 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th was Cory's uh, um, swearing in. Pumupunta lang ako sa bahay para makatulog. Different hours of the day. There were highs and lows too in, in Elsa. It was roller coaster kasi may nagsabi na aalis na si Ramos. Ako, enjoy na, enjoy kami. Tapos hindi pala nag-aalis. Nag, uh, and then I watched Cory as she was sworn in. As president of the Philippines, wow, what a what a moment that was. And that was a really high na oh, nagtagumpay na. And then watched Marcos take his oath for the same position with his family, including his wife, who was governor of Metro Manila, cabinet minister, and his son, who was then governor of Ilocos Norte. Alam niyo si Marcos tried to the very end, in spite of being sick to death, huh? to keep his hold over the Filipino people and the people were having none of it. So you ask myself, so I asked myself, why think of the people power revolt that happened 30 years, 36 years ago? Anong ka-importansya now? Of, anong importansya niyan ngayon? Kasi mga anak, because recent events have given me a sense of deja vu. We revolted against Marcos then. Are we going to allow his son to be president now? Just kupo. They are made of the same cloth. Why did we revolt against Marcos? Because he led the country for 20 years and brought it down to its knees with the collapsed economy, inflation rates at 50%. Foreign debt was close to 100% of GDP. Ngayon, 60% na. Natatakot na ang mga, mga tao. Noon, 100% of GDP na. And what we found later to be a very serious poverty problem. After all that, I mean, he failed this money. After all that, he still wanted to hold on to power, keeping from his people the fact that he was sick, almost to death. He tried to steal the 1986 elections, disregarding the will of the people. Ajan kami, ayo magpa. You know, the people refused to be coerced. Now, his son wants to lead the Philippines and tells us that those were the golden years. If that were true, oh, why was there a revolt? Why were there some demonstrations, etc.? A revolt. The only golden years were for his family and their cronies. And maybe, alam niyo si Mrs. Marcos told me that when she was newly married to Mr. Marcos, she went down to the basement of their, their house and she saw 7,000 tons of gold in the basement of their house in, ayun siguro yung golden years nila, that 7 million kilos of gold huh, in the basement. <laughs> in 1986, si Cory ran against Cory Aquino, widow of a senator of the Republic, who was assassinate, assassinated, if not at his orders, at the orders of those very close to him. Marcos brought out the worst in the Filipino with his lies, with his cheating, with his stealing, with his world-class corruption, his human rights violation, his rule of law, rule by law and abuse of it. Does that sound familiar? In contrast, Edsa and the widow brought out the best in the Filipino. Sharing, caring, sacrificing for the common good, uniting. Now, the son wants to follow his father's footsteps. But now also, thank God, we have another widow, supremely qualified for the presidency to bring out the best in us. Baka naman may diferensya between the father and son. Alam nyo, kita ko lang, where Marcos Sr. was a bar top notcher, and Marcos Jr. 
is a college dropout and fails to admit it. Where Marcos Sr. was acknowledged as highly intelligent, Marcos Jr. failed to pass his qualifying exams at Oxford University and also failed in the Wharton School. That's the only difference. I have one last thought, mga kapus, mga alak. I have one last thought, and that is about the widows. Si Cory was marangal, matapat, matapang, and makabayan. So is Lenny. The closest that the Marcoses can get to those four qualities is that their surname starts with the same two letters. And that is Edsa on my mind. We toppled him. We do not want any of his kind back. Thank wow. you. Thank you, Winnie, for your account of that of our roller coaster ride. <laughs> our next our next speaker is veteran and multi-awarded journalist Ed Lingao. Over the years, Ed has been with the Manila Chronicle, the Manila Times, ABS-CBN, Sky Cable News, and the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. He is currently journalist for TV5. He has been associated with popular shows such as Hoy Gising, The Correspondents, and The Chiefs, as well as for reports and documentaries such as on media killings and the Ampatuan political dynasty in Maguindanao, for which he won first prize in the first humanitarian reporting awards of the Committee of the International Red Cross in the Philippines. In February, 1986, Ed was a journalism student at the UP and a student activist. Welcome, Ed. Hi, maraming salamat. And uh, well, uh, it's an honor to be invited here. Uh, I was I was 18 years old in <laughs> 1986. Oh. <laughs> ano yun? Third year uh, journalism Third. student ako sa UP nung mangyari yung people power. Pero atas ako ng konti. Ah. Atas ako ng konti. Uh, dati po akong loyalist. <laughs> Wow. I was brought up in a politically conservative family. I studied in a seminary. It was, uh, you know, it was a time when we were all steeped in the post-Vietnam War hysteria of anti-communism. Um, so I do remember, um, nung, nung pinatay si Ninoy, nung 1983, I was in first, I was in first year uh, sa UP. Primed pa ako nun, di pa nakishift sa journey. Uh, when Ninoy was killed, I was saying, uh, impossible na yung administration na nagpapatay dyan. Kasi hindi naman tanga si Marcos. So I was pro Marcos then. Uh, nakikipag-argumento pa ako sa mga kaklasiko sa UP. <laughs> At alam mo naman sa UP, pag makipag-argumento ka, <laughs> walang katapusan yan. So yun, I'd, I'd go into uh, these heated arguments and debates. I would defend Marcos to, to the death. Uh, um, it had to be the communists. Uh, it couldn't have been Marcos. Uh, and all this, all this time kasi I was thinking, I was brought up with the thinking na ang choices mo lang talaga uh, in life and in this country are either Marcos or the communists. Nothing else in between. Uh, it was just purely a, di a dichotomy uh, between the two. Kung hindi ka pro-Marcos, abay komunista ka at nasa bundok ka. So, yun. Yun, yun, ang, yun ang thinking ko noon. Uh, in 83, I was a freshman then in UP. Pero mabuti lang, nasa UP ako kasi dun sa UP, well, I'd like to think, medyo imposible uh, maging bulag at sarado ang isip uh, kahit tatanga-tanga ka, pero dapat bukas ang isip mo eh. So, pag, uh, pagdating ng 1985, sumasama na ako sa mga protesta. Uh, I had completely discarded yung, yung thinking ko na, ano, na it was just Marcos or the Communist. There had to be something in between. Uh, so, yun. Uh, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd uh, go out with, you know, with my 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 uh my, my classmates my fellow students would, would go out in protests and rallies kasi garapala na rin noon yung panahon yun eh by 85 garapala na siya eh. <clears throat> so i became more active by the time the snap elections rolled around i was already a poll watcher for for unido uh if you do recall uh ang uh, opposition kasi noon uh, was uh, unido and pdp laban uh, versus marcos as kbl so unido and pdp laban on one side 
and Marcos and Kibyo the other. So I really find it really, really very funny whenever people say na puro kayo mga dilawan at uh, puro kayo mga ano, uh, kayo mga edsa-edsa dyan. Nila nila alam yung party in power now <laughs> was, the, was the primary dilawan. <laughs> But you know, people tend to gloss over those things. Eh. Now, just some snippets from 36 years ago. <clears throat> Um, exactly a year, uh, no, ex exactly uh, 36 years ago today, uh, February 22, Sabado po yun, ng gabi, uh, natatanda ko po, napanood ko sa television, Marcos was presenting two military officers uh, in a press conference from Malacanang. At sabi niya, mayroong assassination plot or assassination attempt against him and his family. One of those officers was uh, then Captain Dick Morales, who would go on to become general and would later be embroiled in the field health controversy. Pero at that time, until, uh, until ma mag-retire si Dick Morales, he was always known as a reformist. Eh. Uh, at that time, he was an aide of Imelda Marcos. <clears throat> he was tasked with, ano, eh, with the with the uh, the job of bringing or guiding the troops of bring the commandos of Gringo Anasan into the Marcos residence from the Pasig River where Anasan and his, and his group were supposed to to come in by boat so yon ito may assassination attempt daw sa kanya so ako naman para drawing na naman to binobola naman tayo nito John, di, di ka pa ni paniwala to so tinulog ko na lang hindi ko lang alam <laughs> nagtawag na si Cardinal Sin sa EDSA <laughs> so tulog ako nung unang araw ng, <laughs> ng EDSA revolt umaga kinabukasan February 23 um, that was a Sunday nabalitaan ko na kasi uh, nung panahon yun tutok lahat sa radyo eh. uh, wala man siya sa TV uh, mas, mas puro radyo eh, siyempre walang internet Balit-balit balitang balita dumarami ng mga tao doon sa EDSA. Oh, ano nangyari? Nagtawag si Cardinal Sin sa EDSA kasi nga ano uh, si Enrique Chacon si Ramos bumaklas na. So, after the noon time mass doon sa UP Chapel, uh, kahit pa paano ay eh, religious pa rin naman ako. Uh, nagpunta ako ng EDSA kasama yung isa o dalawang kaklase. Uh, mga classmates. Uh. So, nag-public lang kami as is usually the case. <clears throat> Pagdating pa lang ng Cubao, wala na, wala na makakadaan. Kasi dun sa Pitwason ng Cubao uh, and uh, from Pitwason moving southbound, wala nang pwedeng dumaan na kotse kasi it was a sea of people. Talagang puro ulong makikita mo bobbing up and down while they walk up and down the, the huge lengthy span of EDSA from Pitwason until Ortigas. Talagang, well, It was a shocker talaga for I I don't know if uh, any anybody seen that many people at any one time uh, at that time. So surrounding it's uh, mula pitwas ng Ortigas, tindig talaga ang balahibo mo. Uh, so we got down, uh, we joined the crowd uh, in Edsa and uh, well uh, I don't recall too much anymore of the journey kasi from Pitwason nilakad namin yung Edsa hanggang Ortigas kanto ng EDSA. Uh, and this is where this is where a lot of things a lot of other things happened. We were among uh, hundreds of thousands specifically at the corner of Ortigas and EDSA. Kung saan uh, merong tatlo or apat na well we call them tanke pero technically they're not. Eh. They're landing vehicle tracked uh, armored personal carriers, APCs. Sa malaking ano, uh, APCs 'yan na mga 38 to 40, ton, 40 tons each. So mabigat na mabigat at malaking malaki parang isang parang isang hollow block na nilagay mo sa kalsada. Uh, talaga nakabalanda doon. Uh, these were the Philippine Marines and their orders were to advance to Camp Paginado and Camp Crame. Uh, I do recall ang daming tao nakapaligid doon sa mga well, I call them tanke para mas mas simple buhay natin. Ang daming tao naka, naka palibot doon sa tangke at daming marines din nakapalibot sa mga tangke para walang basta-bastang maghagis ng granada o molotov. Um, and oh, medyo chismoso kasi ako eh. So, diyan pa lang ako noon pero hindi, hindi pa ako reporter pero chismoso na ako. Uh, I do remember nakiki nakikisaga pa ako ng ano ng usapan ni General Artemio Tadyar, yung commandant ng Philippine Marines who was there in front of uh, one of the LVTs yung mga tangke. Nakikipag-argumento siya with Boots Aquino. Uh, si Tadyar was insisting na no, uh, we have our orders. We need to go to Camp uh, Kramer Aguinaldo. I don't recall anymore which one. Uh, uh, we have to follow our orders. And our orders say we have to go there. And si Butch was arguing back, hindi pwede kasi 
uh, as soon as lumapit kayo, magbabakbakan kayo. Magpuputukan kayo at magpapatay ng Pilipino sa Pilipino. And I remember, Tadyar insisting na, no, 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 makikipag-usap lang kami. Mag-uusap lang kami. Uh, hindi kami magpapuputok. Eh, ayaw maniwala ni Boots. Actually, wala namang niniwala. <laughs> wala namang niniwala. Ano sila? <laughs> they, they bring four, four tanks and... Uh, <laughs> and and so many V150s there so that they can chat hindi naman siguro ganun so inisip namin no there's no way that that's going to happen kasi siguradong bakbakan na yan eh ala nagtagang back and forth sila eh ako naman parang kikilig lang ako ng ganun um, until finally na, na frustrate na si Tadjar uh, sabi niya basta I have my orders uh, si Butch was saying no hindi talaga hindi pwede hindi namin, pap- hindi namin kayo papadaanin magpapatayan lang kayo magpapatayan na uh, and you know it, it's not a good thing for Filipinos to be killing fellow Filipinos so so si Butch Aquino insisted na no we will not let you pass sigawan yung mga tao wag padaanin wag padaanin uh, so si Tadyar uh, biglang nawala I suppose he went inside or he went to his command vehicle and yung mga marines na naka-station dun sa harap ng tanke o ng LVT eh, nawala din Uh, so naka nakaramdam kami na baka ano baka magmo-movement sila baka gumalaw sila so nagsigawan yung mga tao luhod 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 eh nagluhuran naman kami <laughs> nagkataon lumuhod kami sa harap ng tanke ah <laughs> uh, napapuesto ako sa likod ng mga madre ito ito pa yung picture oh yan nakikita sa likod ko that was taken by Pete Reyes of the Manila Times uh, yan yung itong nandito uh, ito itong over here uh, that's uh, that's a marine uh, with an M203 pa uh, just before nila pa andarin yung mga tanke and I'm the one over there yung mga shades anyway so so load 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 wag padanin wag padanin nagluhuran naman kami feeling ko na isa na ako naman kasama ko kasi biglang nawala sila biglang <laughs> biglang yung mga katabi ko mga hindi ko kilala pero sige lang nasa likod naman ako ng mad eh kung may mangyari naman sa amin siguro diretso ng langit Uh, so, yun, bumulaan na kami doon sa harap ng tanke Huwag padadaan, huwag padadaan Nagsimula mag-rosari mga mate uh, I, I remember this is distinctly eh. uh, Nag-rosari mga madre Hail Mary, Our Father Tapos kumanta kami ng ama namin Bayan ko, lahat na makanta namin At lahat na madasal namin, dinasal namin uh, Nung panahon yun, di mo na may isip Kung ano mangyayari talaga eh. uh, You just think na, you know If something has to be done You have to be there to do it And I suppose that's that's the attitude of a lot of people then. Uh, kung may ganun pagkakataon, bay, basta gawin mo lang kasi kung walang gagawa, eh, sino pa nga ba kung di ikaw? E biglang umandar yung makina ng tanke. Ang garalgal nun, diesel. Nagaralgal eh. In, talagang malalim yung tunog. Tapos bumuga yung sino sa tambucho sa, ta, sa taas, bumuga yung maitim na maitim na usok. Kasi nga diesel. E nawingwang lahat. Uh, yung mga nakal- kaming mga nakaluhod biglang nag- nagtumbahan ng gato <laughs> tapos biglang umabante yung, yung parang kumadyot lang pang, parang nang, nang, nananakot so lalo nagpanik yung mga tao nag, 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 nagpihayaan yung mga tao na paluhod na, pa, na nagtumbahan pero at the same time sigawan pa rin mga tao na huwag papadaanin load load huwag papadaanin so talagang ano talagang sige stay lang tayo dito stay lang tayo dito uh, kahit anong mangyari imbis tu- so imbis na tumabi Eh, <laughs> imbis na tumabi <laughs> lalo nagdasal <laughs> but this is also something that struck me eh. uh, I'm sure you've seen the video clips nung umandar yung mga tanke tapos sa uh, umabante yung mga photojournalists sila mismo ang sumugod sa harap namin uh, I, I'm sure you've seen those video clips eh, kasi naka-vest sila tapos may mga gear sila, nakaganon sila sa mga tanke. I know, it's it's all symbolic eh. Uh, nilagay nila yung mga palo nila sa bakal ng tanke na parang tinutulak pabalik. Of course, it's all symbolic because, because you know, uh, these are 40 tons of uh, heavy machinery eh. Uh, wala ka nang talaga magagawa pag umanda rin mga yun eh. But it was a symbolism that was not lost on any of us. These were people who were supposed to you know supposed to be unbiased who were supposed to be in a way neutral who chose at that who chose at that moment to take a stand and that also struck me so yon uh, also what also struck me was 
Teka. <laughs> Sila mauna bago tayo. <laughs> anyway, so yun, bumala na yung mas maraming tao. Nagkagulo lalo. At namatay bigla yung makina ng tangke. Nung namatay yung makina ng tangke, lalo nagkagulo, nagsigawan yung mga tao. Doon mo lang talaga marirealize yung nangyari. Doon mo lang talaga marirealize yung nagawa ninyo. Uh, at doon mo lang talaga matatanong kung bakit mo ginawa yun. Pero hanggang ngayon, hindi ko, ko pa rin masagot. Eh. <laughs> so, yun. Um, that, I, I think that happened mga twice. Uh, nag, uh, uh, nagpandal ulit ng makina, tapos uh, nagkarangan ulit. Uh, eh, that, that happened more than once. That, that I'm certain of eh. So there were many occasions for people to step up, for people to make a difference. And that was the time, that was the day, and that was the moment, and that was the place, among many others, when Filipinos chose to make a difference. And a lot of things, a lot of other things unfolded along the way uh, in the next three days, um, in varying degrees of excitement and and terror and peril but uh, i suppose for me that uh, that particular day marked uh, marked that era um my thoughts today well people blame edsa now for the ills of the philippines sabi nila kung hindi napatalsik si marcos eh, the first world nation pa rin tayo a uh, first world nation na tayo ngayon uh, yung golden years pagpatuloy uh, i just have a lot of issues with that There have been so many attempts to rewrite history. Uh, I've had people say or claim that it was all a marvelous photo opportunity doon sa kanto ng Edsa Tortigas. Sila kayang bumala, bumala na doon at magpa-photo. Tingnan natin kung gano'n sila katapang. Mocha Uson called it drama ng mga madre. Eh, well, Mocha is one to know drama. Uh, so, yun. Uh, I, I just have three points. Number one, if we are really worse now than it was before EDSA, that is certainly untrue. Sabi nga ni Maring Winnie, the poverty rates were astounding. Uh, 44 to 50 plus percent. Unemployment rate was at what? 33 percent. We're the laughing stock of not just the, the world, but to, not just the region, but also the world. Now we have democratic space restored. Now people are much better off. They, they just don't realize it because they just want to complain. And that to me is so, so sad. And daming daming living information dahil may internet na, hindi, hindi ka na kailangan mag-index card sa library, hindi nila magawang mag-Google. Number two, it's as if those who moved in EDSA were the, were the ones who ruled the Philippines for the last 36 years. And that is so patently untrue. There were three presidents who are basically anti-EDSA. You have, uh, you have uh, ERAP, you have Gloria, and you have Duterte. In fact, those three presidents now stand with the administration. So when they say tatlong dekadang naghari ang, ang liberal party at ang dilawan, they don't know history or they just refuse to recognize history. Because it was the PDP laban, not the LP that was <laughs> primary in EDSA <laughs> to begin with. But then that's lost in a lot of people. And lastly, it's as if EDSA was supposed to solve all of our problems as a country. I always say this, eh? EDSA was not supposed to solve the country's problems. EDSA was just a chance to do a reboot, to do a restart. It was a chance to allow people to vote again and be counted, to make their voices heard, and to make their own choices. EDSA was not about telling people who to vote for after 1986. Right? It was just giving you the chance to vote and to speak. And now people have the voice to speak with and they misuse it. And now people have the vote, the vote to choose with and unfortunately they also misuse it. So, yun. Um, was that a failure? No. I suppose we were the failure. Ayun. Mam Tati, yun po. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, our final speaker this afternoon is General Emmanuel Bautista. General Bautista is a retired Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Prior to his appointment to the highest military post in 2013, General Manny held various posts in the service, including Commanding General of the Philippine Army, Commander of the 3rd Infantry Division, 
and Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, AFP, leading the formulation of the AFP's internal peace and security plan, or Bayanihan. General Manny is recipient of numerous distinctions, including five distinguished service stars, a gold cross medal for gallantry in action, and a bronze cross medal for bravery. The military and service to country are in his DNA. His father, Brigadier General Teodulfo Bautista, was commanding general of the 1st Infantry Tabac Division of the Philippine Army when he and 34 of his men were brutally massacred in Patikul, Sulu. General Manny was a plebe at the Philippine Military Academy when the massacre happened. In February 1986, General Manny was a young lieutenant. Welcome, General Manny. Maraming salamat po at uh, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Isang karangalan na ibahagi ko sa inyo ilang uh, pag-iisip tungkol sa EDSA. Uh, and para ito sa inyo, mga kabataang Pilipino. Uh, Nag-graduate ako noong 1981 sa PMA. Kaya noong 1986, I, I was a young officer teaching economics, uh, military strategy, and military history sa PMA. And uh, later in my career, uh, nasabi na ni Ma'am Pati na nag-chief of staff ako ng AFP. And so I had the privilege to keenly observe and be part of uh, what has happened to the AFP in different points in time and from different perspective, from the tactical or micro point of view to the strategic or macro point of view. And relating it to the history of the organization and later on even crafting a long-term vision for it. So uh, let me then focus uh, on uh, my thoughts uh, my thoughts on the big picture marami na tayong nadinig ng mga karanasan karanasan individual na karanasan ng mga nandun sa EDSA so i i will focus on the big picture what was the situation prior to 1986 we had a president who held on to power for more than two decades when the constitution allowed a maximum of only two four year terms and uh, gaya ng nasabi ni Bishop, he extended his term by declaring martial law and effect a dictatorial rule. In that long period, we saw the country gradually deteriorate from one of the leading nations in East Asia to one of its laggards. Uh, gaya ng nasabi ni Tita Winnie, uh, si Tita Winnie, teacher ko sa economics sa uh, UP, uh, the, the economy was in shambles. Democracy has been degraded. And quality of life went down. There was abuse of power and corruption. Internal security situation deteriorated. The legitimate opposition and other avenues of legitimate dissent were destroyed. Unfortunately, the only organized dissent that remained was the communist uh, CPP and PA. And so many of our youth joined the rebels. Also, as martial law was declared, the MNLF separatist uprising erupted. While martial law was lifted in 1981, the almost one decade it has been in effect allowed the dictator to deliberately undermine our institutions by either demolishing them replacing them, co-opting, or suppressing them. And among these institutions were the constitution, legislature, justice system, political parties, the church, civil society, media, and the military. Uh, but having said that, let me highlight the fact that elements within these institutions later proved resilient and held the line with the desire to stem the deterioration of our country. They stood up to restore our institutions to their rightful role in providing balance and to restore our democratic way of life. And the AFP was one of those institutions. From day one, 
of his legal term in office, the dictator worked hard to gain the favor of the military. After all, it was the instrument he will use to implement martial law. He had control over promotions, designations to key positions, and largis at his disposal. By the time he declared martial law in 1972, he had firm control of the AFP. So what happened in 1986? Well, uh, what happened was the pent up emotion of our people realizing the deteriorating condition and the desire for a better Philippines erupted. While dissent was building up prior to that, what finally ignited it was the coming out of a sector of our military, many of them young officers, including cadets at the Philippine Military Academy in support of our people. Those elements within the military, together with those from the church, media, colleges, and universities, and other sectors, gave our people the courage to effect change. And it was the collective effort of all of these institutions, together with our people, that made things happen. So what was in the mind of the military back then? And why did they do what they did? There are several considerations that inform the thinking of the military. First, the military took seriously its historical role in Philippine society. The armed forces traces its roots to the revolutionary army of Andres Bonifacio. Then and throughout history, the armed forces fought for the Filipino people, winning independence for the Filipino people and defending this country from various threats. And during critical times in our history, the armed forces has always decided on the basis of national interest. 1986 was a time for the armed forces to live up to its legacy and advance the interests of the Filipino people. Second, members of the military are very protective of their institution in terms of professionalism, its identity, and cohesiveness. It's esprit de corps, deeply rooted traditions, and organizational discipline has ensured its resilience as an institution. Third, it's solidarity with our people. And this is very well reflected in the mandate, which was later incorporated and institutionalized in the 1987 constitution. The AFP is the protector of the people and the state. Its goal is to secure the sovereignty of the state and the integrity of the national territory. And the AFP takes to heart this constitutional mandate. While the AFP commits to legal authority, the ultimate determinant of its position is what role the Filipino people wants the military to perform. And because of this historical experience, and in order to safeguard its resilience against future attempts to undermine the professionalism of the military, reforms were initiated within the organization. And in order to ensure that professionalism is institutionalized, a long-term transformation program was later undertaken with the vision of achieving a world-class armed forces that is a source of national pride. Now, what lies ahead? We are again at a crossroad of our history. The danger of further sliding back towards our deplorable conditions in the past is real. This is further complicated with current threats to national security. And even as we speak, our sovereignty and sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea is being threatened. And so as we commemorate the EDSA spirit, let me pose this challenge to our youth. As in 1986, I call on our youth to play an important role, to take the side of the Filipino people and to secure the future of our country. After all, this is your future. I have faith in the Filipino youth, its intelligence and sound judgment, its patriotism, its desire to make a difference. Uh, I recall one time when I was a guest speaker in a college graduation, one of the veteran professors confided to me that compared to the past, 
the students of today are more intelligent, more discerning, and more inquisitive. And that gave me a sense of optimism. While many may say you are the future of this country, I have a different view. I believe you are the present. You do not have to wait for the future to make a difference. You can play a decisive role now. So my advice to our youth, discern the truth from the myths, fake news, and lies. This coming election, make the right decision for the Filipino people, for our country, for yourself. Choose and support a leader who is best qualified, who can and who will restore the economy and jobs for our people. Defend the West Philippine Sea and address other threats to national security. Govern professionally and morally. Safeguard our health. Follow our laws. Choose someone who does not lie, cheat, and steal from the Filipino people. So I call on our youth to make a difference now. Maraming salamat po at mabuhay ang kabataan Pilipino. Thank you so much, General Manny, for that very powerful challenge to our youth. Thank you to our four speakers, Bishop Ambo David, Winnie Monsod, Ed Lingao, and of course, General Manny Bautista for remembering EDSA, why it happened, and what it means for us today. Many in this room today were not even born at the time, and we have invited four student leaders to react to what the speakers just shared. I will be calling them now to give their reactions, but let, let me just announce at this point that we have activated the chat box to allow participants to put in their questions for the open forum, which follows. I'd like to call the first student reactor, Kara Angan, Sangkunian President of the Ateneo de Manila University. Good evening, Cara. everyone. Good evening, Paul, and good, good evening to everyone here. I think that the stories we heard today put a more human face to those who struggled during martial law and came out during people power. This is no longer just a history lesson for us, no? Because we have to remember that these happened to people on the ground. I can't help but resonate with the story of General Bautista because my family was a military family during martial law. Yung lolo ko, dating PSG ni Marcos, pero yung tito ko, isang general din sa PNP, ay isa sa mga cadets na binanggit ni General Bautista na, luma, na lumabas at lumaban sa EDSA. Ngayon, parang ang daling sabihin na mag-move on ka na sa martial law ang tagal na nun. Dahil sa makinarya ng kalaban, ang lakas ngayon ang disinformation, lalo na sa social media. We forget that those who went through martial law are still here and still alive to tell their stories. Hindi lang ito propaganda, ika nga ng mga iba na, na naniwiwala pa rin sa martial law. Our session today wasn't just a history lesson or a retelling of stories. These are first-hand accounts. These are personal stories that people still remember today because of the impact the events had on their lives. However, like before, not all of us have forgotten EDSA. Kumakapit pa kaming mga kabataan, mga aktivista, sa pag-asa at pagmamahal sa bayan na nagsimula sa EDSA. We push back against historical revisionism now because of those who fought for the truth 36 years ago. Hindi lang ito election ngayong Mayo. Ito ay isang laban para sa katotohanan. This is the fight that will determine my future, the future of my friends, my loved ones, and the nation at large. I may not have been alive during EDSA, but its spirit lives on today. I see it in my friends organizing in communities, showing up on the streets, diving headfirst into policy advocacy work in fighting disinformation, elect electoral engagement, and more. Whenever I think of EDSA, I remember something a mentor once shared to me when talking about his own story. He told me that he brought his children with him when he walked on EDSA. When his family found out he was bringing his children with him, they told him not, not to because it wasn't safe. His response is something that I will never forget. 
He looked at them, smiled, and said, if the children don't see democracy in action, how will they learn to fight for it? That remains true until today. We see democracy in action all around us. We have to not just open our eyes, but to join them as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. That was very moving. The next reactor is uh, Kenneth de Guzman. He's the University Student Council President of Holy Angel University. Kenneth, please. All right. Hi. Hello, Bob. Good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me, no, a student who uh, was not born yet during EDSA 1 uh, to this conversation. This is very much helpful for us uh, students who are in this meeting room. Of course, there are a lot of things um, unclear po sa amin, probably because of the period gap or even because of the existing historical denial. And quality of life went down. There was abuse of power and corruption. What was that? The internal security situation deteriorated. The legitimate a, opposition just a minute, and other values of legitimate dissent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for solving that. Okay. Sorry, go on. I'm sorry, Kenneth. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, But there is one thing I would like to share on the question of, um, is EDSA a failed revolution? Because, you know, I'm not a political analyst, just a student researcher po who would just want to compare and contrast things based on facts and uh, draw a, a certain analysis, which is very important nowadays because and dami pong um, misinformation and disinformation. No? It's, it's proliferated around the internet. So while we commemorate 1986 as a people power revolution um, as a significant historical occasion, we must also continue to raise tough questions and confront harsh facts or realities about the long-running democratic experiment that started po on that day. So while it has been a decade, um, political institutions have barely progressed as political families continue to dominate um, elected positions. So a popular argument would be and that you will see today in an online discourse is that uh, the Aquino critics and Marcus's loyalists um, position that EDSA 1 was not a revolution, but a glorified people's coup. So if you ask them, real revolutions would have led us to a drastic political change by now. And obviously, this perspective of the revolution is a Marxist-style concept of revolution in which the outcome is a transfer of power from the elites to the poor or the proletariat. Since the power was just transferred from the Marcoses to Anakino, and the events that followed this so-called revolution have welcomed the political dynasties, Edsa I was therefore, and still arguably, a failed revolution. But the thing here is, we need to analyze how do we define the word revolution. As a student researcher, to view Edsa I as a failed revolution is a perspective of the revolution formed in hindsight. Just because EDSA 1 did not successfully eliminate political dynasties, the century-long problem on corruption, and even the attempt, or should I say a copy of uh, another homegrown tyrant who have tried his best through his war on drugs to hold our necks all together again, it does not mean that the revolution itself uh, has failed. No? Moreover, this Marxist theory uh, of class conflict could not accommodate this type of revolution back then because this involves bloodless multi-class coalitions that cut across the board. What is important for critics to recognize is the difference between the revolution and revolution, revolutionary change. You know? So EDSA 1 was indeed a revolution. The twin events of Ninoy Aquino's assassination and the deep economic recession in the mid-1980s as a result of Marcus's debt-driven growth strategy has sparked the political unrest. What followed the revolution was a successful change in regime and government. The revolutionary change, however, did not materialize as most people had hoped. Economics Nobel laureate Douglas North argued that revolutionary change usually involves an abrupt change of formal institutions, such as laws, government systems, and that is something that uh, Aquino had in fact achieved. No? She suspended the 1973 constitution, she, abo she abolished the Batasang Pambansa, and called for a commission to draft a new constitution. But revolutionary change usually falls short in changing informal institutions, 
such as the deep-seated cultural role of family clans and Filipino political life. So the, the reality that political dynasties continue to monopolize Philippine politics is something defenders of the EDSA-1 revolution must confront. And many years after EDSA-1, Philippines remains a flawed democracy. Nevertheless, the country should continue with its experiment mm -hmm. in, in, in discovering the, the combination of political institutions that will serve the Filipino people best. At least, the EDSA People Power Revolution was one such experiment that worked and toppled a dictator. So I cannot agree any better from Sir Ed's words from Ed's, that EDSA wasn't supposed to solve our problems, but to reboot and restore democracy, because that was our goal during that time. Now, that the future is in our hands, I would like to highlight that we might have been controlled by a homegrown tyrant for more than 20 years before, but the people were challenged and a revolution happened. Now the namesake is attempting to regain the power of their family, wishes to vindicate themselves from the accountability, and to us, we are challenged to debunk and pulverize any attempt from one family for their names to be on our minds again. Edsa on my mind, must be a twofold objective now. One is to inculcate to us what transpired during the EDSA one, and two, how do we sharpen our fellow Filipinos to have a collaborative building of a better Philippines? That will start on May 2022. So from the youth sector, we would like to extend our thanks for your glorious hope to the speakers that has pushed you to participate in a revolution that has scared us in a democratic space as of this moment. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Uh, our third reactor is uh, Liam Osorio, former vice president of the Central Student Government of Finma Cagayan de Oro College. Is, is he here? Is, is Liam in the room? No, not yet, Rene. We're waiting for Liam. Uh, he, he, he warned us that he is actually organizing pajak drivers in Cagayan de Oro and so may not make it in time. So I, I suppose he didn't make it, right? Ma'am Tati, uh, Mr. Osorio is not with us currently. He's not with us. Okay, very good. Then, then we'll go to our last student reactor, who is Renee Ko, the student regent of the University of the Philippines. Renee, please. Thank you very much, Ma'am Pat. And Good afternoon to everyone in this room, and thank you so much to the organizers, to the speakers uh, for this forum, uh, for sharing their memories, experiences, and lessons from martial law and the EDSA people power, in which we collectively rose up to remove the Marcoses from power. I have heard and read history of, uh, the, of martial law, and siguro po, uh, many of us here have done as well. But it is a different experience to hear firsthand stories of what happened, how bad it got, and how everyone thought that this cannot be our status quo any longer. We have read the atrocious acts and naked grabs and, and abuse of power. And we understood how injustice and violence ran rampant for the self-interest of Marcos Cronies for years. But it is another thing entirely to internalize that thousands, millions got up from their homes wore their hearts and dreams on their sleeves and demanded better. Demanded democracy, peace, justice, and accountability. With their warm bodies, strong voices, and raised fists with collective action. Together with the consolidated power of the people. As an advocate and an organizer, means an iniisip ko po, these numbers are a dream. One that we strive every day to achieve today. If the same number of people manifest for a policy, for a principle, or against an abusive sitting president, we can achieve anything. However, uh, truth be told, for this generation, 36 years later, we have not replicated the same momentum. Some would think, dahil ba hindi kasing lala ang nangyari ngayon kaysa noon? I don't think so. At an age of social media, of great technological advancement, of algorithms creating bubbles kung saan madaling makulong sa priority of self-survival and self-care and little gratifying acts of pleasure. Mahirap ma-breakthrough ang thought na pare-pareho tayong inaabuso in little ways sa maliit na pagkukamal ng ating taxes, 
sa hindi pagbigay sa atin ng mga benepisyo and yung uh, welfare na dapat nakukuha natin at iba pa. And sa mga mas malalakas na boses, sila naman yung pinapatay at pinata, pinapatahimik. Mahirap ma-breakthrough why all of us should care. As we established comfort zones, reinforced even by policies, it's more difficult to see how majority of the Filipinos have it worse and had it worse during uh, martial law. Mas mahirap ma-internalize how we all need to do something physical, focused, consistent, and selfless for overall change. I can't help but think po, uh, as everyone shared their stories and how everyone rose up, that tyranny and dictatorship, dictatorship manifests itself today, both, both worse and more subtly, but it is still equally bad, if not worse. I've heard testimonies from my parents, for the most part, politically neutral, that they did not particularly suffer more during martial law. Then I see comments on Facebook saying their lives under Marcos were not bad. And then it gets distorted by paid trolls or even beneficiaries of actual cronies saying that their lives felt better. But in contrast, we also know that our rights and freedoms were systematically being disregarded and limited. Human rights violations were conducted in the mountains and in the streets. The story of Boyet Mijares, who was tortured and killed for questioning a Marcos in a public forum, the famine in Negros, the buried workers of the Manila Film Center, the indigenous peoples driven out of their homes for environmental violence, and more. And it's the same now. Some days feel normal, but if you look closely, another massacre happened in the Calabarzon region. A doctor was killed for standing up to its community. The whole sector, the whole health sector's clamor for greater wages and benefits were ignored lest they starve themselves or tire themselves to death. And in a blink, 30,000 have died in a drug war. In a blink, the Marcoses were able to escape yet again from another Supreme Court conviction in other ways in which our sectors are understanding of what democracy and the truth is, is overturned. That's how insidious historical revisionism is and even just suppression of information. During martial law, it was the active censorship of media outlets. Today, it can be seen by putting truth and lies at the same platform equally, and even amplifying actual lies by paying trolls to disseminate wrong information, to harass critics, democracy lovers, advocates, and more. I was able to empathize, sympathize with the story of Sir Ed in how my UP education enlightened me, not just how bad it is, but what all of us can do. To everyone that uh, can listen and are registering in this forum, yes, let us continue using social media for the better. Uh, what we have now, uh, we're able to disseminate information at a much faster rate. But this isn't enough. Our awareness and understanding of what's wrong and what must be done to correct it must transcend our mind and our keyboards and find ground in the communities with our neighbors, with the vast majority of Filipinos getting by every day. We must uh, be able to have our advocacies see physical presence through door-to-door -door, um, pakat, through being able to immerse in communities, to actually go through the grind of every day of walking or going by to our feet, and reaching out to the many sectors beyond these uh, virtual means. The descendants of these tyrants, dito po si Bongbong Marcos, Sara Duterte, they've teamed up to continue the plunder of our nation. This tandem of children of tyrants that thrived in corruption and crimes against the people puts a great threat to the future of our nation. And uh, the greatest victim, all Filipinos and the youth. We have long been abused and exploited by powerful dynastic families, securing immunity through continued hold of power in government positions. And a dark future of abusive and tyrannical kind of leadership awaits us if we let these forces enter and devour our most treasured peace and democracy. So we should not let the work and efforts of past generations go unhonored and those of future generations wasted on fueling the lavish lives of political families. If Bongbong Marcos and Sara Duterte are committed to collaborating with each other, uh, burying the dark past of the Marcoses, of the Dutertes, we, the youth and the Filipinos, we have in turn to pledge to sustain and strengthen the unity to prevent the, this alliance to gain seats in Malacanang. We pledge to intensify efforts to expand this unity to all youth and sectors in the Philippines. 
today of all days, there, need, there needs to be a wide and firm opposition to successfully confront these threats to the future. So uh, individually and collectively, let us resist these alliances, let us resist the different ways in which our histories, our truths are abused and forward the truth and the future that we want. Thank you very much for sharing how much uh, lessons you uh, created under martial law, under people power, and we hope to translate the same today. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Renee. Those are really fighting words. Uh, before we um, entertain the questions from the chat box, may I ask the speakers if they'd like to react to the, to the students' the points? This is the younger generation. Very, I'm very hopeful if uh, they really uh, represent the youth, there's a future for this country. So, um, Bishop Recording Ambo, stopped. Yeah. Well, I, I just uh, want to thank- Recording in progress. Yeah, our reactors, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so edified listening to them. Yeah. And parang uh, nakakaroon ako ng pag-asa na- uh, tama si General uh, uh, Bautista no, na, uh, they're not the future they're the present and uh, and I hope uh, young people are listening no? uh, to your fellow young people kasi ito yung panahon ninyo eh. kami, tapos na yung panahon namin ha? dito pa kami, you know we're, we're here to accompany you pero kayo ang nasa forefront, you know salamat, salamat sa inyong reflections Thank you, Winnie, Mareng Winnie, for your mga anak. <laughs> it has reinforced what, I, what I've always said. The young people of today are so much smarter, more intelligent, more concerned than we ever were in our time, Tati. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember what I was doing when I was in college, and it's amazing what they, the students now are doing. So. I, I know the future is in good hands as long as, for God's sake, you make the right decisions now. During the elections. <laughs> okay, Ed, as former student activist, what are your comments? Um, well, very brief lang. Um, uh, yeah, well, yes, I, I think we all agree we, we do have a flawed democracy. But in the end, it is now again, once again, a democracy and people are free to choose again people are free to speak again and well like it or not people are free to make the wrong choices again <laughs> that's how democracy is <laughs> that's ex that's exactly what democracy is uh, so yeah the, the reboot again i always go back to that the, the reboot is not what you blame for the choices that you made along the way since you did the reboot. Uh, you've been given the chance for 36 years. So how can you blame 1986 <laughs> for all the other elections since then? Um, and yeah, in, in speaking about uh, about our experiences in 1986, well, we we don't really intend man, uh, you know, mag, 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 mag cute or mag ng bangko. No, uh, in fact, we 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 tell you these stories in in a way because we also want you to recognize that there are many many more people who came ahead of us, who've gone ahead of us, many more people who have fought silently and who have died quietly all for 1986 to happen so years before the, the ground groundwork has already already been laid and so all we ask for is that i uh, know basically all we ask for is that that you know right, right. that you remember and hopefully that you learn from our actions and also from our mistakes and that you listen to some of our stories mm -hmm. before we all pass away and our stories disappear into the web. <laughs> on that on that note, General Manny, I hope you intend to live much longer. <laughs> no, I'd just like to say that, uh, reiterate that 
I have faith in the Filipino youth. And from what I heard from our reactors, I am very optimistic. I am very much inspired. Thank you for those words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we have questions, a lot of comments on the on the chat box and really people saying they learned so much and also people sharing their own EDSA experiences. But we, I'm going to ask Milet Tindero to, to choose a few questions to, uh, to share with, uh, with the speakers. Okay. Hi, Milet. Okay, here's the first question. As of the present, the great mass of Filipinos are blinded and sort of hypnotized by disinformation and historical revisionism that has been systemically going on for a very long time now through social media and other means of communication. What can be done to somehow rectify this sort of counter revolution? Thank you. Anyone would like to start on that? Yeah, that's that's a good question for all of us. Yeah. Um, sige. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, ibang arena ng labanan ng social media. Eh. Yeah. It, uh, kaya napakahalaga na yung ating kabataan, you know, are listening. Uh, kasi kayo ang digital natives kami mga anong tawag niyo sa aming generation tourists <laughs> dinosaurs <laughs> that's right you know uh, isang malaking blessing ang digital technology and for unfortunately the same technology that is used for information is also used for disinformation no the same technology that's used for communication is also used you know for spreading fake news at ang hirap ngayon yung tipong uh, you know for people to to call it alternative narrative <laughs> parang it's it totally relativized truth no uh, kaya kami sa simbahan talagang nanindigan din tungkol sa katotohanan you know you don't toy around with with facts you know uh, you don't say that's how you look at it, you know, but there's another way of looking at it. Parang ganun, no? you make it all totally relative. No? Um, there are undeniable, undeniable facts. Kaya ang hala, napakahalaga ng mga uh, facts na sinabi ni Maring Winnie kanina and si, si Ed. No? Um, so, ibang uring labanan nito, I think you have to teach us how to be more uh, more uh, present and uh, how to communicate our message more effectively sa social media. Uh, ako, ang aking contact sa social media, Facebook lang talaga. Tapos kahit marami akong followers sa Facebook dahil sa mga homilis ko, napapansin ko na ang aking followers eh, medyo kaidad ko na o medyo mas matagal <laughs> sa akin. No? Sabi nila, uh, nag-migrate na yung mga kabataan from Facebook to TikTok, Instagram, you know, and the other applications. Kaya, you know, uh, we, we have to be present in all the other platforms and uh, uh, yung to, to influence in a more positive way. No? Kasi <laughs> kawawa din yung mga na deceive no sa social media anyone else uh, want to tackle how to how to combat this counter revolution uh, 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 I, I have i have a suggestion but i don't think a lot of people agree with me <laughs> okay let's hear it ako <laughs> kasi when when on, on social media, nakikipag-away ako. <laughs> when people post uh, disinformation and troll me on my wall, I fight back. I, 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 I'm sorry, but I, I don't believe in, uh, no, in, in uh, no, yung, yung starving the trolls. Starving I don't believe the trolls, eh. yeah. Uh, I think you have to confront people who spread misinformation. And because, because people see, see you when you do fight back and they get, they get empowered. Otherwise, tayo tayo lang mag, mag, nagtatago tayo na tayo tayo lang nag-uusap. Uh, if you don't show that you fight back, nobody else will fight back in public, and then and then you you default to to those people. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard both sides of that too. That 
that's correct. That the reason for all of this, uh, young people these days believing what they they see in social media is because people who know better never really confronted and counteracted it. So I think we would also have that responsibility. Any other comments before we go to the next question? Maringwini, do you have a, we would end and Manny? I am not at all, you know, into computers, except you, you saw what happened, <laughs> etc. Yeah, I, I know how you, I know what you mean. Facebook, I'm not in Instagram. All I want, you know, and I, when people uh, react to my columns, they react negatively to my columns. And the, it is so clear that the basis of the reaction is nothing. I mean, you know, parang they didn't even read the column to see what the logic. Yeah. Medyo yung para kung, my God, what, what, am, what am I going to do to try to convince this person? Wag na lang. Hindi so you give up. Yeah. Too hard. Not worth, not worth your time. And yet, Ed Lingao just struck a, you know, sympathetic chord in my heart. Now, if you don't fight back, who will fight back? You know, it's just like before, you know, in, in during Marcos' time, people were saying, you know, <laughs> don't go and don't vote in the elections. Gago pa sila. If you don't vote in the elections, you're giving the victory to 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 the the, yeah. uh, the opposition and that's what and that's what Enlinga was saying if you don't if you don't fight back but I cannot fight back I, I don't know how you don't so, have the tools I mean you say and Winnie Monsod agrees with me <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> good uh, General Manny uh, yes uh, uh, I think nothing has changed even in the past there were disinformation, misinformation, propaganda. It's the medium that has changed. But now with social media, information goes around faster. But uh, what is new now is the use of troll farms for deliberate, uh, faster dissemination of uh, disinformation. And so we, we just have to tell the truth, keep telling the truth. And uh, as Ed said, uh, keep fighting back. I promise to do better. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll get another medal, General, for this for this war. Uh, Milet, next question. I think this is a question for General Bautista. Uh, the 1987 Constitution was crafted out of people power revolution that toppled Marcos. Having cited the Constitution that we currently honor and follow, if in case Marcos wins, this is BBM, is it not a direct insult to our constitution? What should the military do about this? What should the military? The, the military has a mandate, has a constitutional mandate. And uh, it, it takes reference from that. Now, what the military does is what the Filipino people wants the military to do. It, it, that is the ultimate determinant of what the military does. So wh what do we want the military to do? We want the military, uh, often we want the military to remain professional. Uh, yeah. It is the only institution and in government mandated uh, to secure the people and the state. And its goal is to to secure the sovereignty of the state and the integrity of the national territory, protect the people and the state. And it has to remain faithful to its constitutional mandate. Uh, and so, uh, but again, as I said, uh, what do we want the military to do as a people? It's all in well, our hands. Part of our fear, in general, is that they will, they will do what uh, the a strong leader wants them to do. Because we've heard that uh, you know the the current uh, leadership has been courting the military, and so we don't mm -hmm. know how much faith to still have in it. We're hopeful, yes. of course. Uh, as I cited earlier, based on our experience. Uh, 
with the past dictator. The, the military uh, instituted the reforms. In fact, uh, came up with a long-term transformation uh, roadmap and in order to institutionalize professionalism. While there is initiative with, within the organization, as I said, the military takes its cue from the Filipino people. We have to motivate our military to remain professional right. and to remain nonpartisan. Uh, you, you cannot tell the military to be not political because it's an instrument of politics, but you, they have to be nonpartisan and that should be our effort. All right. So we, we need to exert that influence, that social pressure over the military to remain professional. Uh, yeah. May I clarify that further, please? Yeah, yes, ma'am. You are saying, therefore, that General Ver was not, you know, was not a good military person because he was not trying to protect the Filipino people. And that is why you have this army transformation program. You're hoping that the transformation program that you instituted is going to be strong enough to prevent another General Ver from coming up. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I don't want to single out any person, General but, Vera, but, I, uh, but yes, as an institution to remain professional, as an institution, uh, so that we always adhere to the constitutional mandate and we always take reference from what the Filipino people wants the military to do, and that is to remain professional. And the, the, the organization itself cannot do it on its own because after all, it is the army of the people. It is the armed forces of the people. And therefore, we as a people has the obligation also to motivate the armed forces to remain professional. And that's on all of us here. So I think that is one of the lessons of EDSA because basically that's what the military did. Ultimately, they remained the armed forces of the people. They, they did not, most of them did not, uh, uh, they, they, they did not open fire, et cetera. And they really, you know, got into the spirit of EDSA. So that we hope that, yes, uh, Winnie. My spouse very violently tells me that the military has already showed its, its I, I suspect that that was Chris whispering yes, to you on the side, tell him to come in. The military did not, did not accede or did not, did not accede to the revolutionary government idea of Mr. Duterte. He was yeah. really trying to put that over and the military said, that mil that revolutionary government is out of the constitution and we're I not going that was as early <laughs> as early yes. as 2016 the military already said in the coming that's good yeah. yeah but to yeah to follow up on uh Winnie's <laughs> uh statement and uh, note that uh, you mentioned the leadership in the past yeah. But note what the leadership today uh, is talking about, telling the armed forces to remain nonpartisan, to be constitutional. Hearing it from the leadership of the armed forces and the Department of National Defense. But they are for the anti-terrorism. Yeah, so we have to, we have to remain hopeful about our military through all through all this. Not just uh, hopeful, yeah. we have to, as I said, actively Demand. motivate, yeah. actively right. motivate our military to remain professional. Right. And yet, uh, uh, Gen uh, General Lorenzana supported the anti-terrorism. Secretary. Uh, Secretary Lorenzana uh, supported the anti-terrorism law. Papanino, explain yan. 
that takes another webinar perhaps to uh, discuss that. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, discussion. Well, if, if, can I just uh, squeeze in? Uh, very short, sure. lang. Uh, I, 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 ako, I completely understand the General Bautista's uh, point of view. Um, the military is there to to ensure the protection of democratic institutions and democracy itself. Eh. Uh, so, if people make the wrong choices uh, in a democratic environment, uh, I suppose, I suppose, uh, it's the people who have to correct that. And not the military, because if the military steps in in a That's democratic true. election, then there's something wrong with their democracy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's that's equally dangerous. Uh, uh, right. The the what the military is is our own making. But let, let me just say this: we have to have faith in the military. It is our armed force. We have to have faith in the military. And through, as I said, throughout history, note that the military has always decided on the basis of national interest. And we just have to articulate very clearly uh, what is in the interest of the Filipino people. Maybe we can go on to the next question. <coughs> um, I think this question is for Mr. Lingao and Ms. Monsod. What do you think is the crucial role of media in these coming elections, especially that Bongbong Marcos is seeking the presidency to reclaim power? I, I defer to Maring Winnie first. <laughs> I'm not the professional media person you are. <laughs> oh, so yeah, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, of course, uh, there's a big, big responsibility on, on the shoulders of media to ask the right people the right questions and to not simply digest or swallow whatever they're given, eh? which, is, which is why we've consistently been trying to get, uh, you know, uh, without saying any specific people, we've been trying to get all the necessary candidates to, to, uh, no, to, uh, to not just give their platforms, but also to address certain controversies. I, I, I make that specific because, you know, for, for candidates to give platforms, ano lang yan, pangako lang yan eh. Madaling gawin yung, yung platforma, madaling, may ibang gumagawa ng platforma eh. Uh, binabasa lang ng kandidato yan eh. So it's easy for them to, to, to spout out their platforms. I think what's more important is for candidates to be grilled on certain specific issues that will hound them or are still hounding them from the past. Uh, uh, just as an example, not, not necessarily in any particular order, just as an example, Bongbong Marcos and the ill-gotten wealth that is still with them and the 23 billion pesos of, uh, of uh, unpaid uh, estate tax liabilities from 1997, of which he is the estate administrator, and the $6 billion that, is, that are still undercovered. What will happen uh, what will happen to all of that? So these are questions that media needs to ask. Um, problema lang, I think, is that a lot of reporters and editors don't even bother to do, you know, uh, to to do research before asking questions. So hindi na itatanong pag may pagkakataon. Uh, and, and also a lot of reporters don't feel comfortable with uncomfortable questions themselves. So don't may problema ang media. Uh, kami doon. If you see my background now, meron ay ang background ko specifically wag ko corrupt election this is a you know a, a a group of media who have who have promised to try to ask the right questions and not be not be influenced by press releases i don't know whether it will be it i mean we will succeed but we are trying the media i uh, i am part of this uh, of this group, I, I certainly hope that we ask the right questions. But unfortunately, Mr. Marcos Jr. does not even want not to attend. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to participate. He's trying to be above it all and saying, you no, know, he he wants you know unity and nothing else. The fact is, he's really scared. 
because if Edningau gets to him and starts asking those questions, he's, he'll, he'll not be able to answer. I mean, he, they owe 205 billion pesos in unpaid real estate ta taxes because of their the interests and penalties on what they, they haven't paid. They haven't paid the real estate when since his father died. For That's God's right. sake, real estate, you know, estate taxes, sorry about that. And 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 Edlinga would love to ask him, but Edlinga does not have does does not have the opportunity because Mr. Marcos is talagang he refuses. He will not join any public debate for fear that he will his, his, the emperor has no clothes. Hindi ba? So what are you going to do about that? What is the media, you know, Ed, what is the media doing about the fact that Mr. Uh, Marcos chooses his, uh, his forum, his forum? Uh -huh. I mean, you we, know, keep we, we keep on insisting on, ano, on an interview. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to force them. Eh. Uh, not even Kamala can force them. Uh, so we keep on asking for interviews. Uh, and and pag may pagkakato na may mga interview minsan makas maka request ka ng singit na tanong pero in the end in the end iba pag iba pag ibang tao magtanong eh kasi you know the 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 gem is in the follow up question eh it's not in the first question eh so there's also that also i think a, a problem is that ano eh um nalulusaw unfortunately nalulusaw yung ano yung influence ng mainstream media in 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 the elections uh more and more candidates are are, are reverting to uh micro influencers on on social media youtube facebook doon sila nagi invest doon sila lumalabas and that is what uh, well specifically bongbong marcos is doing they're not they're not uh, specializing in the traditional campaign ads of of all the of the traditional ones uh micro blogging uh micro influencers that's how they get engagement that's how they uh, get their influence and that's how they do the rounds so nag shift eh. Na, kasi nag-shift din ang viewership. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, in part, it's a problem sa media, but also in part, it's a, may, 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 may meron ding responsibility yung viewers eh. Saan kayo manunood? <laughs> Kung yeah, parati kayo yeah. sa Facebook at di kayo nanood ng mainstream, eh, talagang <laughs> doon sila magpupunta. <laughs> may, may add something to Yes, please, Bishop Ambo. Yeah, okay. Um, and I hope you don't mind my saying this. No? Hindi ako media... Uh, pero pare-pareho naman tayong may mga pagkukulang ng mga institusyon. Pero masyadong obvious ang pagkukulang ng media. I think uh, yung media, uh, yung has contributed a lot to the stultification or idiotization of the public. Yun lang mga public affairs show. Talagang pinush ng pinush sa late hours. no uh, There were a lot of intelligent you know talk shows. Tapos... Uh, na talagang issue oriented pero wala yung mga media companies talagang ratings game yung gusto nila yung ang dami mo magagaling na mga uh, magagaling na journalists you know uh, but what do they talk about mga mga aswang mga lalaki na buntis yung bang naging entertainment ang media for heaven's sake uh, parang we kasi kayo ang mas wide ang reach eh. Di akadim kasi, yun lang pumapasok sa eskulahan eh. No? Ngayon nga, ayan no, binabatikos na tayo ng mga nagchat-chat no, na masyado tayo mga Inglesero. Uh, ibig sabihin, we are the educated class, uh, elite. Uh, sino ang makakausap natin? Di tayo-tayo din. Yung ganun ba? Kami nga ang mga Catholic bishops. Nag-examination nag of conscience din kami dito. <laughs> ay nga, uh, Tingin mo nga, lahat ng ating mga pastoral letters, English. Tapos, so, sino kinakausap natin? Baka, kaya hindi ta, yung mga institusyon talaga natin, whether the academe or the church or the media, uh, we have a lot really of soul searching to do, examination of conscience. Pero hindi naman, hindi ko sinasabi ito para magpagilti lang. Kundi para sabihin, ang spirit ng EDSA is an unfinished project. And now we're talking. Look, uh, you know, uh, this political situation is contributing something very positive. No, parang we're, we're conversing. We're trying to listen. We're dialoguing with one another intelligently. 
sana, alam mo yung, ang dami nagsasabi, sana marami makarinig nito. Sana, you know, when they open their television, they'll see people talking like that uh, at uh, what, yung, uh, not at late, late night, no? Kasi pati yung mga news naging entertainment eh. You hardly get any news from the regular news, no? Sorry about well, it. <laughs> Bishop, I agree. I, I completely agree po. And to tell you frankly, it's an internal struggle talaga in the industry. It's a never-ending struggle. But at the same time din kasi po, it is, it is not a monolithic industry. I mean, uh, you, you have no control over everybody else. Uh, it's, uh, it's, each, each is his own republic. <laughs> <laughs> and even then in your own republics even then in your own republics you also have your own struggles uh, whether it's with middle management or your colleagues or your upper management and, and so on down the line uh, I mean I, I can't tell you how many times I thought I would lose my job because of uh, <laughs> the fighting I had to do in, in, in some of my, uh, my, uh, my, my previous networks and it's really difficult uh, uh pero nga eh, in the end uh, in the end it's a it's a struggle uh, it's a daily struggle uh, that we just have to we just have to keep on fighting and it's always good to be reminded of uh, of uh, the feelings it's always good to hear that because it helps it reminds us of where we need to go <laughs> and what we need to do all right there's there are more questions um Milen. Hey. All right. Uh, despite the facts given to fight disinformation and fake news, why do you think majority of the people would still want to vote for Bong Bong Marcos? Additionally, what do you think can the youth do in order for them to change the minds of these people and consider voting for a much qualified leader? All right. Who wants to tackle that question? That's the big question. Winnie, did you just disappear? <laughs> Trying to choose my virtual. <laughs> okay, I'm who wants to start? Yes, that's, that's true. And I cannot do anything. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, ano po? Well, the question is, ano? Uh, 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 bakit uh, bat na na ibren si yeah. BBM sa mga ano sa sa mga tao na oh. yung siya pa rin ang gusto iboto. Yeah. Well, well I, 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 I'll do, I'll do a quick one lang ha, and then uh, uh, just to start. Na lahat ng mga yeah. katotohanan panlaban sa disinformation and fake news. Yeah. I'll do a quick one lang just to get the ball rolling. Uh, just to get the ball rolling. Uh, ako, there, you're looking at several levels of problems. Eh. One is, ano, uh, um, there's so much resentment uh, developed over the years and over the decades uh, because of so much expectations uh, starting from 1986. Um, uh, a lot of those expectations were not met. Uh, of course, we are much better off uh, now compared to 86. That much is a given. Eh? Uh, pero there, there are a lot of people who expected much, much more than that. That's one. The other one is uh, uh, for more than a decade, and daming, and daming alternative narratives na lumitaw under the radar. Uh, we've noticed that this as early as 2011 and 20, 2012 on YouTube. Uh, nauso yung mga... Ano, yung mga uh, mga video clips na parang ano na very very simple very colorful bombastic music ang ganda ganda ng pagkakaproduce pero with alternative stories on EDSA on the Marcoses uh, on People Power and, and on the last three decades and mas compelling ang narrative na yun at mas ano mas mas madaling kagatin kasi napaka simple at pangatlo ay suppose sa pangatlo well walang nakulong na Marcos eh. <laughs> So ang daling ang daling iangkas doon ng argumento na na eh, wala kayong nakulong eh. eh di, <laughs> baka hindi totoo lahat ng paratang ninyo. <laughs> I know it's simplistic thinking but uh, if you put them all together eh madaling madaling umangkas doon sa ganung paniniwala. Why why can't the counter narrative be as powerful because they're very strong uh, proofs that this disinformation but parang hindi tumatalab. Mama Koy, the, the, one of the best counter narratives is this eh. Yung Swiss bank accounts. Yeah. 
ruling na yan with finality sa Supreme Court in 2003. That's GR 152154. With finality na yun, na ibalik na po yung pera. Naggasos na nga yung pera. Malino na malino yun. But when I say that uh, aloud, uh, when I do a story about that, when I write about it on Facebook or on social media or when I write about it on, on mainstream media, uh, I get trolled na that's fake. That's not true. Oh no, here's the link. You can read it yourself. Hindi ko babasahin yan. <laughs> Hindi totoo yan. <laughs> so, uh, doon pa lang parang, anong gagawin ko? <laughs> so one wonders also how much of the counter-narrative is trolling or how much is a real belief you know in in all of these stories because it's a mixture of both right it can't be that they all are firm believers in in bong bong marcos but and... just a minute why why are we so depressed this is this is what happened in the last elections in 2016 uh, the uh, mrs robredo was was nothing she was 3% when she started when she started her campaign for the vice presidency and she just worked and worked and worked and she'll get there i am very sure she'll get there because as we hold this fora and people get to know more it you know it will it will have a multiplier effect but you cannot expect miracles now because bongbong has had 6 years to to prepare and and and, and we're just starting now so I mean, we know we have. It's a very, you know, it's a very hard road to 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 go. Oh, but but it can be done. I have faith. I have faith in the in the youth of today who are going to be able to somehow go through this forest of untruths and and uh, show what you know sh show. General Bautista and Bishop David, that their faith in the youth. My, I have faith in the youth. You know, they're not. It's not going to. Be, not, yeah. it, 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 no, I really believe that. Just, just wait. Except, of course, the youth. You know, tend to obey their parents, and if their parents say, "Vote for Bong Bong," wala na tayong magagawa. Uh, any other comments, or else we move on to the next question. Uh, Ma'am Patty, can I comment? Sure, Manny. Earlier, regarding the media, sometimes we blame the media uh, for entertainment, but uh, we, we, it's more than that, really. Uh, it's our people demanding entertainment. Why has, why has that happened? Is it because of our education? Is it, is it because of our upbringing? Is it because of the environment now? But it's got to be more than the media. The media caters to what is the demand. After all, they're a business. Uh, that, that's something we have to accept. So just our thoughts on that. And they say that really the span of attention is very short. So everything caters to that. So all these other <laughs> the mainstream media and stuff they produce might be too long for the average attention span. Um, a goldfish though has a longer attention span than an ordinary person. But but let me just add to that. Uh, uh, I, I I want to I want to look at it because from both both sides of the picture. Eh. On one hand, po, on one hand, um, on one hand, uh, the media's job is not to give people what they want. Right. It is yeah. to give people what they need, the yeah. and that yeah. is what we are supposed to be calling editorial judgment. So that is the, the burden of that is on us. Hindi uh, uh, hindi namin pwedeng ipasa yon na kasalanan niyo hindi. Kasalanan namin yun talaga. Uh, as an industry that is a that is a failing of media. We are not supposed to be giving you what you want. We are supposed to be giving you what we think you need based on editorial judgment, on relevance, on accuracy, on uh, timeliness, and all that. All the the values of uh, of journalism. On the other hand, and this is the other side of the coin, man. On the other hand, it really, really helps. It really, really helps uh, those who are fighting for better, uh, better journalism in within the industry. It really helps them a lot when people vote with their remote, when people really choose better programming. Because, uh, like I said, this is the other side of the coin. Eh? Uh, I I I hear I hear a lot of people complaining na ang panget panget ng ng Philippine media uh, broadcast. 
And that's true. But on the other hand, but ang pangit din ng ratings pag ano, pag uh, ang ganda ng programa eh lahat na pupunta doon sa mga entertainment sa sa ano. So on one hand, on one hand, you realize that uh, you know, uh, the people a lot of people want a certain thing that is not necessarily good for them. So, so it does help really those who are fighting for better media. It, it helps them a lot when people vote wisely with the remote. When you when you patronize good programming, when you patronize good shows, they don't get pushed off the 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 programming grid because people are watching. But if people are not watching because they prefer noontime shows or entertainment, eh, mamamatay ka talaga. So yun po. Those are the two sides of the coin. Yeah, those are the facts of life too. Uh, any other any other comments on the on that particular point? Because there are more questions. Milet. Okay. How can we educate the youth about martial law when martial law is not included in our history books? What must be done? What must be done, right? Well, first of all, we have to improve those books, I, I believe, absolutely. And there are some groups working on it now. Um, but please, uh, can I ask the speakers to respond to that? That's true, there's the, our, the a study was done by the Far Eastern University Policy Center, and truly the accounts of martial law, much less, and, and also I suppose EDSA, are really very scant and very um, incomplete. Well, you know, I think, I think it was really a gross oversight on the part of the Department of Education since 1986. Even, even Brother Armand Luistro, when he was there, he didn't do anything. And you know, all the education secretaries, parang hindi nila binasa yung mga textbooks eh. You know, they were more interested in the policy directions or anything. I don't think anybody actually read what was, what was being fed the students. And uh, you should be the one who should be talking about this Tati, because you are, you are an educator, you know, a long time educator. Ako, college ako eh. So I, I didn't know what was going on in, in, in the elementary schools. My God, they were actually praising Marcos. That's true. So how can you expect anything? Talagang nabulag tayo. That was our incompetence. May I say something to that? Yes, please, Bishop. Yeah. Um, well, ako, when I look back, uh, uh, sa, sa sarili kong karanasan, hindi naman ako sa textbook lang namulat eh. Kundi sa mga kwento ng magulang ko, sa mga conversations that I had with good friends. Parang ang kulang sa atin ngayon, live conversations eh. Uh, because, uh, yun na nga, masyado tayong nakatutok sa mga cellphones. Uh, nagkukulang tayo ng interaction, live interaction. I wonder how many parents told their children about the EDSA People Power Revolution. Uh, nakakakita na ako ng comments sa, sa chat box na, oo nga, no? parang doon tayo nagkulang, hindi na ikwento, yung ganun ba? Yung, kasi iba yung testimony eh. Uh, doon sa pag binasa mo lang in black and white. Katulad nito, no? Medyo, may pagka-testimonial yung kwento natin eh. Iba, iba ang dating, di ba? Iba ang dating. And look at the appreciation of people and says, wow, this is powerful. Kasi nagkukwento kayo eh. You're reflecting on, on something you really experienced. Ako nga, I, I, I was really glued to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the stories of Maringwini, of Ed, of General Bautista. Yung ako, participant, pero... I mean, resource person dito, pero naging participant, listening really closely to what they had to say. Kasi marami akong hindi alam about, about EDSA na first time kong narinig sa kanilang mga testimonies. So we have to continue telling that story. Yes. Any other comments on that? But as I said, that there, there are projects ongoing about our textbooks. But of course, that is going to be long term. And it's true. The analyses have been really uh, frightening, you know, what, what the kids are learning in school. But uh, on the other hand, 
as Bishop David said, that's not the only source of learning. I, I read an article by Hill Yuson and he was saying that he was really feeling guilty about not sharing the Edsa story. So when he turned, I don't know, 70 or whatever, he got his grandchildren together and told them the story of, of Edsa. So that's part of our responsibility. That's true. Just listening to you guys tell the story, I was reliving those days all over again. And I asked myself the same thing. How often do I talk about it and, and to whom? And so I guess that's part of the examination of conscience we have to make ourselves. When we're talking about this and, you know, what is the pagkakulangan of our education? I'm just going to run. Okay. For example, you know, we're talking about the Constitution. The Constitution, the 1987 Constitution was, you know, was born out of the EDSA experience, social justice, etc. But uh, I, I, I am told that only that 72% of the Filipino people have not even read the Constitution. And so where the hell are they going to know what their rights are, what their responsibilities are, what the vision is? If it's, and where will, they, where will it be not be taught if not at school? Hindi ko naiintindihan yan. Bakit hindi na, bakit hindi na, you know? Okay, this is, this is an examination of conscience. How many of us, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that I see here, how many of us had actually read the Constitution? At one time. You do yeah. you know, but Winnie, that, that is a required subject in school, you know? Where? And, and most hated. Where? Yeah, it is, in, in college, everyone has to take constitution i don't know not i don't know in up i i have not heard anybody talk about ayan ang dami dami nagre raise their hands ayan all of them have read the constitution yeah, they, that's a required it's course eh? not be. not a very popular course i must say well, so then, then you should make it popular right exactly that is a living thing i mean you know if you give stories of why that came into the, the being read the the, the uh what do you call that? Yung, the discussions behind it, talagang it's gripping. Kaya lang, sure. ang dami-daming babasahin eh. Well, you, had, you have first-hand accounts because, of, because your husband was in the Constitutional Convention. So. The he, deliberations. Deliberations, you know. And those deliberations are written down. They're there. You can see exactly who was for what and and why? Why? Yeah. And the arguments. So it becomes a living thing. It's really interesting. You know, we're we're running out of time. It's um, it's six. It's past six twenty. Oh, Maybe one God. more question, uh, Milet. If there a question that. Uh, okay, this is a question that. for Bishop Ambo. Since one of the candidates, I think that. The person asking the question is referring specifically to Bongbong Marcos. Since one of the candidates is obviously opposite to the teachings of the catch of the Catholic Church, <laughs> would the church consider as an institution to make a stand against him? Well, you know, you just need to tell the truth. And um, yeah. We're about to release a pastoral ourselves about uh, about uh, you know I, I don't want to preempt you know what uh, is going to come out but uh, Tagalog I hope you know we just we oh Tagalog <laughs> Tagalog na ngayon ng pastorals namin uh, you know we uh, now we have resolved to write it in a Filipino language no pweding Tagalog pweding Bicolano pweding Ilonggo basta the English will be a translation from a Filipino language. Yun yung right. resolution namin. Yeah. But uh, yun, kailangan lang talaga na ano, uh, to, to, to tell the truth. I think that's what matters most. Eh. Uh, because ang kalaban talaga natin dito, untruth. So, uh, yun yung labanan eh. A fight of narratives eh. So, we... Can I, 
that's the role the that they had, right? In that's Africa. right. They, they, they came out and told the truth about the elections and yeah. uh, that, uh, that helped move things along. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder whether at this point, I, I should now take the opportunity of asking the speakers for their final words uh, to, the, to the young people. Most of the people in the audience here are, are young, are students and young people. So your message to the future as well as the present, uh, according to General Mani, they are the present, not just the future. So parting words, please. I'm not out of my final words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what's, what's a better term for it? <laughs> Parting words. <laughs> Your takeaways. Sige, Ed, you start. Ay, yun tuloy, tinaman ako ng kidlat. <laughs> ako po, simple lang naman. Um, uh, uh, sa akin kasi, it's simply, ano eh, it's simply a matter of, ano eh, uh, you standing up for what you believe in to be true. Uh, and that's all there is to it. Eh. Well, of course, you have to know for a fact that it is true to begin with. But, and that, that entails you know, that entails the responsibility of doing your research, of doing your reading up, of knowing your history, and uh, and not being irresponsible with information. But, get, but given all of that, uh, once you have all the responsible information in your hands, then you fight for it. And that's all there is to it. Eh. Uh, it doesn't matter if you lose or you win. Uh, it's better to lose after a good fight than to lose just because of default. At least mapagmamalaki mo sa mga anak mo yun. Yun lang po. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Uh, okay. Uh, nung kabataan ko, may natutunan ako na isang kanta na inawit ni Corita nanalo siya sa likha awit pambata and I don't know, lakas ng dating sa akin na namemorize ko talaga yung kanta ang sabi niya uh, pangarapin mo bunso ang isang magandang mundo, mali ng aming panahon, sa panahon mo iwas to uh, tapos ang refrain niya sabi niya bukas mamanahin mo buti namit sama bukas malalaman mo, ikaw nga ang pag-asa Dapat hindi bukas, kundi ngayon na kung saan kami nadapa, doon bumangon ka. At kung ano nga aming tama, bukas patibayin pa. Let that be my parting word. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, General Manny? Yes, I've uh, said much already, but let me just say that uh, I hope sana itong nangyari ngayon. Uh, ay hindi ang uh, pagtatapos mm, pero ito lang sana mag-trigger ng ano more conversation na pag-usapan natin that we need to talk to each other we need conversation uh, and yun lang sana ang ano i hope uh, this will trigger more conversation uh, among our youth among our people and lalo na sa mga schools uh, Kung meron value na dapat natin makuha dito, iyon, yung kailangan mag-usap-usap tayo. Thank you very much, Manny. Uh, Winnie, you, you have the last word. Well, you know, all I like to say is when you're making a decision and the, you, you're the May 22 decisions, uh, May uh, 1922 election is a very important decision that you're going to make. and and before you make a decision, you're always supposed to find out what are the benefits that will, go, that will come out, what are the advantages of this decision and what are the disadvantages. So you post, post that with all the candidates. You say, what does he bring? And what does she bring? And what, is, what are the disadvantages of voting for him? Which requires that you are going to have to think very slowly. You cannot make a decision just like that because you read something or you or you you or or you found out something. No, you have to bring it, put it together one by one. That's how you make rational decisions. And you know, this may you need to make a rational decision because the president who is going to take over 
is going to have so many problems. I, I really don't understand why anybody wants to run, except that I know my candidate wants to run because she wants to help. The other candidates may want to run because they want more power, but doggone it for the, for the voters. Kayo mga bata, please take the time to list down ano ba ang kanyang benefit sa, ano ba ang, for the country, ha? Wag hindi, wag yung benefit sa'yo. Don't do that. And that is the only way you can really assure yourself that you have tried your best to make the right decision. So do it rationally. Do it the, the economically efficient way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Winnie. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers, uh, Bishop Ambo, um, Winnie Monsod, Ed Lingao, and General Manny Bautista for helping us remember EDSA, for helping us understand why it happened, and also for looking at today and the relevance that EDSA has today. One of the speakers said, yeah, EDSA is is an unfinished project. I like to think of it that way, that uh, there's so, still a lot that we can do in keeping with that spirit that, that, uh, that help us uh, remove a dictator, that help us gain back our democracy. So let's, let's not obliterate EDSA from our national consciousness. Let us keep remembering it and learning from it. And so uh, again, thank you. Thank you to everyone who's here today. Watch out for our future voter conversations and remember to vote and to vote wisely. But I think the, the lesson from this afternoon is never forget. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Maraming salamat. General. <laughs>